Hello, my name is Mateo Hueso. I am a Master's of Counseling graduate from Athabasca University and a registered provisional psychologist in the province of Alberta. Today we'll be talking about working with faith and spirituality in LGBTQ2S plus care. I just want to start us off with a quick story. The photo in this first slide is a picture of a sawdust rug which is an elaborate and temporary piece of art that's laid down in the streets during major spiritual holidays like Holy Week and Day of the Dead in many Latin American countries. The first time that I saw one of these sawdust carpets, I was actually an adult and I was blown away that I had never known nor thought to research what holiday traditions I was missing out on as a Salvadorian person who lives outside of El Salvador. As a person who was born in the Salvadorian diaspora, I've often come to know about things like sawdust carpets through white Canadians who visited Central America on vacation. But although I'm Salvadorian, I'm not sure I'll ever feel safe enough to travel to my, my family's home country um, on vacation like my friends do. This is because the violence and harassment that Salvadorian sexual and gender minorities like myself face within the country pose a threat to my safety. So instead, these spiritual traditions are woven into the fabric of my complex identity and learning about and being a part of spirituality can be more than just a tradition of faith for myself and for many of the people that we'll see in practice and perhaps for yourself as well. So as counselors, it's important to recognize that spiritual and faith traditions are part of many of our upbringings and personal identities. Our belief systems can inform the values we live by and how we reason or make decisions based on these values. Belief systems can inform our sense of self or our identity. And as with the story I just shared, some spiritual and religious traditions can be part of your culture, part of your family's identity, and can be the basis of your social support, community, and sense of belonging. In general, it seems that some sort of belief system ties to positive well-being for many people. A faith or spirituality that affirms who you are and your place in the world can provide a coherent framework for your understanding of the world and contribute to positive mental health for yourself. However, for sexual and gender minorities, it's harder to draw conclusions like this as the psychological and other harms that LGBTQ2S plus people face often comes from religious communities. For example, many LGBTQ2S plus people find Canada to be pretty accepting of human diversity, but we still face many disparities. This changes how we can view the determinants of mental health, like having a faith or spirituality when working with sexual and gender minorities. In a large scale US Pew research study, it was found that a majority of LGBTQ2S plus respondents were religiously affiliated, and one in three found that there was a conflict between who they were and their religion. As an estimated 13% of Canadians identify as LGBTQ2S plus, this means that working with LGBTQ2S plus folks is part of generalist practice. We should all be aware of the major issues impacting mental health with this group. It is very important that we look at what is posing a barrier to spiritual health as it's so important to mental health. One of the more obvious indicators of harm when we're working with LGBTQ2S folks comes from our knowledge of whether there's been coercive efforts to change who that person is uh, in, in terms of their gender and sexuality. So there are, um, instances in which gender or sexuality is less desirable in a community. And due to the belief that LGBTQ2S plus people's identities are wrong, many individuals, groups, and organizations have led change efforts to change the identity of these sexual and gender minority individuals. Change effort programs dressed as therapeutic initiatives with the intent of changing a person's sexual or gender identity are called conversion therapy. The SexNow 2019 Canada survey found that one in five of GBTQ2S plus male respondents had been a victim of change efforts or conversion therapy in Canada. Those affiliated with a religion were more likely to have experienced these harms. This, these change efforts are not evidence-based and they can greatly harm individuals. 
suicidality, substance use, and other indicators of poor mental health increase with exposure to change efforts or conversion therapy. While some parts of Canada have banned conversion therapy, groups that administer the practice have simply changed small parts of their programming to sidestep legal reper repercussions. Most of them do not have to answer to a regulated profession or a regulatory college, such as the College of Alberta Psychologists. A lot of them are religiously affiliated, and so regulatory healthcare bodies do not govern them. The Canadian Psychological Association has renounced change efforts and conversion therapy. Under the standards of practice for Alberta psychologists, we are prohibited from engaging in these practices and requ required to report a psychologist who is known to be performing them. The impacts of religious harm uh, are internal and social. They include suicidality, substance use, isolation, minority stress, low self-acceptance, shame, and internalized oppression, experiences of rejection, and variability in your social and family dynamics. So to talk a little bit about isolation, sometimes LGBTQ2S plus people have not yet contacted a community or they're hesitant to contact a community of sexual and gender minority uh, people. Even though it's been shown that these communities do provide group level resiliencies to their community members. Exposure to oppression or violence and to stories of oppression or violence uh, related to the marginalized group that you belong to increases a sense of internalized homophobic or transphobic narratives sometimes, and it can increase your anticipation of whether or not you will face oppression or violence. And of course, all of this together increases your distress, and that distress is specifically related to who you are and what minority group you belong to. So that is what we call minority stress. Note, for those with a strong ethnic or cultural tie to their religion, uh, that doesn't just have to do with faith, this factor of minority stress uh, seems to operate differently. And this connection to culture can actually modulate a person's reaction to religious harm. So it's been shown in some studies from the US on Latino and Black people who are also uh, sexual and gender minorities um, who attend church, uh, there's, there's a different reaction there because there's such a strong cultural tie to being Latin and going to Latino church, being Black and going to Black church. When we talk about low self-acceptance, shame, and internalized oppression, this is relevant to LGBTQ2S plus communities um, because sometimes there's family inacceptance and there can be harmful social stereotypes and prejudices against LGBTQ2S plus people. Some people might experience discrimination uh, and moral or religious judgment from their faith uh, community, um, especially when those, those affiliations uh, congregations are known to be non-affirming of sexual and gender minority identities. So note that shame and perceived safety together can impact whether a person wants to self-disclose their gender or sexuality to different people depending on which group they're in. It's important to consider their sense of safety if you're trying to make a referral to a faith or cultural group as part of their, their work with you and vice versa. Um, it's still important to consider their psychological safety when making a referral to a, a sexual or gender minority group. In general, you just want to avoid assuming where they're out of the closet to people um, and how, how they relate to the different cultural and faith communities that they might belong to. Note that vulnerability depends on other social factors as well, such as age or cognitive capacity and dependence on others. So for example, a senior who lives in seniors care um, a seniors care home might be more dependent on other adults. And so you don't want to assume that they're out to the staff at their, their um, seniors care home. And you want to make sure that you're planning with them how, um, how religion or spirituality or working with sexual and gender minority communities comes into their, 
their life and their care plan. So why do people stay in spiritual and faith communities? Mental health outcomes uh, were better when LGBTQ2S plus individuals were part of affirming religious congregations compared to those who were part of congregations that did not affirm their gender and sexual minorities um, in the Barnes and Mayer 2012 study. Um, LGBTQ2S plus people from non-affirming congregations had a number of strategies to weather discrimination from their community. The cultural, social, and psychological benefits of a belief system and religious community may in some ways actually protect LGBTQ2S plus members from greater harm. So here's a little self-reflection piece for you. You are interning as a student counselor at a counseling agency. Adam, a 64-year-old man, calls one day requesting a traditional Christian counselor. The front desk administrator tells him that they cannot guarantee the religion of the counselor and assigns him to you. So without assuming, you know, your faith, just answer honestly for yourself. How prepared do you feel to discuss Adam's preference for a Christian counselor with him if he brings it up? And what are the assumptions that you've made about Adam already in terms of his sexuality and his gender identity? So whether or not you're from a certain faith, religion, spiritual tradition, or whether you are a gender or sexual minority, you will find clients who have similar stories to yours and clients who differ greatly on paper to your identities and labels. Wherever you are socioculturally located to the client, you can make assumptions that they are similar to you and assumptions that they are not. You can make assumptions based on stereotypes and assumptions based on not enough information. Be aware of the fact that clients might make assumptions about you as well. The key is to be aware that we as humans are programmed to make automatic assumptions and categorizations of people. As counselors, we try to train ourselves to detect situations in which we're likely to make assumptions, as well as the signs that we have started to do so. Our goal is to relay a non-judgmental stance, not to assume who that person is, to approach them with curiosity and, of course, positive regard. So here's a second reflection for you. Lainey is a 40-year-old two-spirit person who grew up on reserve. They have been referred to you by the social worker at the agency who has been working with Lainey to find stable housing in the city for the past several months. What are your assumptions about Lainey's belief system? So again, whether or not you're from a certain faith, religion, or a spiritual tradition, whether you are a gender or sexual minority, you want to, again, um, look at what kind of gut reactions you're having to a client and their story. Um, perhaps you're generalizing based on some knowledge that you have two-spirit or indigenous people. And we do want to hold that with a grain of salt, making sure that we're making room um, to actually meet the client where they are, that individual client, no matter what our training and our knowledge is of different groups of people. So counselor prejudice against LGBTQ2S plus individuals remains an ever-present barrier to competent care. Bias to our in-group is a human psychological process. In order to promote fair and just mental health practice, our first step is observing our own gut reactions, beliefs, and attitudes towards different groups. One place to start is what does your religion or spiritual community tell you about LGBTQ2S plus people? Or are they even mentioned? How is this, what is said about them or whether or not they're mentioned, how has that impacted your beliefs about sexuality and gender? There are a number of strategies for countering internal prejudice and stereotypes, including accessing education, gaining experience with LGBTQ2S plus stories and clients, personal 
involvement with sexual and gender minority communities and uh, for religious or spiritual counselors, finding a faith or spiritual or other community that affirms sexual and gender diversity so that you're not in conflict in different communities um, in your work community compared to your faith community in the messages that you receive or finding ways to reframe or bridge the scripture where applicable to inclusive practice. If you would like further training on working with LGBTQ2S plus people, there is a free training for transgender uh, inclusivity through the Trans Wellness Initiative, which is an Alberta-based um, health initiative website, um, and they do offer some, some training as well. There's also the uh, LGBTQ2S plus foundations and specific populations trainings through the Rainbow Health Ontario education website. Note there's usually a bit of a cost with the Rainbow Health Ontario online training. Um, so that's, that's about it for today. Thank you so much for taking the time today with me to consider spiritual wellness and counseling practice, especially as it pertains to sexual and gender minorities. I wish you well on this journey.